right, welcome back. This is lecture 12, our very last. Um, today, the goal is to wrap up a few loose ends, field some questions, and generally uh, start to cut the cord so that your next apps will not be assigned in the form of PDFs, will be of your own uh, design. So this is where we started, if you can recall. This is our very uh, exhilarating mobile web app that we started the course with. But hopefully you feel all these months later that you uh, now have much more in the way of knowledge and tools under your belt when it comes to both Android and iOS alike. So among the things we thought we would do tonight is, one, thank um, Tommy as well as the rest of the team. JP is here this evening. Um, so if we could, and we'll, even though um, only a few of us are here locally and most are remote, perhaps just a round of applause for the team for helping us out so much this time. Thank you to the entire team. Um, so just some shameless plugs. Um, if only, this is all freely available, so it's, I guess, not too shameful. Um, but if, after this course, you're interested in diving into some other material related to the mobile space or the web development space, know that this past spring we've been offering a course at the college, which is on mobile software engineering. There's definitely been some overlap in the course. Um, in fact, they did a, a variant of the Evil Hangman project. But whereas this course is focused on iOS and Android alike, this one focused primarily on web development and on iOS development, and also focusing more on software engineering itself. In that course, we had students working in pairs, learning more about source control, collaboration, and the like. So you'll find that there's definitely some overlap. But if of interest um, in learning a bit more about either of those, do feel free to tune in. It will all be available within the next couple of weeks freely online at cs164.tv. And it's already available at cs164.net, uh, which is where the current semester has been. So feel free to take advantage. Um, also, if you like the web aspect of the course, um, about a year ago, we last offered this course, Building Dynamic Websites, which focuses on LAMP and AJAX, uh, not at all in a mobile context, really just in a desktop environment, but realize that the videos and the projects there are all available online. Uh, and that will be offered again this summer through the summer school. And then lastly, this one's not related to mobile at all. And for most people, is sort of doing things in the wrong order. But we always have some students in 75 and 76 that go back and take this particular course, which is meant to be a in, uh, rigorous introduction to computer science itself data structures, algorithms, and programming. And some students, but a, a relatively small number of students in this class in years past have found that it fills in some holes. Or uh, they realize in taking this course, oh, maybe I should have taken them in, in this order. So, but not necessarily a bad thing if it fills in some gaps in knowledge. So I thought I'd share just a fun uh, look at some of the features that are uh, possible uh, underneath the hood with these devices and also some of the threats and some of the privacy concerns that arise that we start reading more about but you don't necessarily think about. And this was a story that came out about a year ago. This software was released called iPhone Tracker when it was discovered that Apple was not encrypting the GPS coordinates that the phone was collecting um, and then uploading to iTunes. So anytime you were to sync your device with iTunes for backup purposes or updating purposes, this was before iCloud, um, the phone uh, typically would upload a raw a log of all of the places you had been, been. And that was the result of the GPS transponder or even some Wi-Fi geolocation. Um, so this is useful for Apple Y to track everywhere you're going. And Google does this as well. OK, so, so localized search results. That's compelling to know where you are. Advertising, Advertising as well, sure. Wi-Fi connections. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. You might know from uh, non-3G devices, like iPod Touches, they still somehow have this curious ability to actually geolocate. And even some laptop browsers can do this as well. And yet, in theory, Apple does not know where I live and where my access point is and the like. So how, more specifically, does Apple or Google know where I am if I'm only on Wi-Fi? What's the relationship here? Yeah, exactly. So back in the day, uh, trucks, and Google still does this for Street View purposes, for instance, but you, people would go around war driving, so to speak, trying to find wireless access points. Then often early on, it was just to find wireless access points for the sake of having access. But there's also some value in this, because if the car or the truck has its own GPS transponder, and it knows what latitude, longitudinal coordinates it's at, and it drives past my apartment and realizes, oh, David Malin's access point just was sniffable in this nearby area, they can then make a mental note. Note that, okay, David Malin's access point is at this 
GPS coordinate. They can do the same thing for quote unquote Harvard University, quote unquote for all the Linksys SSIDs in the world, and so forth. Upload those to the server so that in the future, if my browser says, OK, I get a signal from David Malin's access point from Harvard University and from Starbucks, you can do sort of triangulation tricks and then infer from the Wi Fi access radios that are within reach where that person is. Not with as precise uh, detail, but at least a pretty good circle can you determine there. So that's useful. Um, and so iTunes was logging this information, but it wasn't at all encrypted. And you might not think this is such a big deal, but if you have this big XML file on your hard drive um, and you have roommates or friends or spouses or significant others, you don't necessarily want someone to have a variable list of absolutely everywhere that you've been. So this was discovered. Apple has since patched this, so the tool is not as much fun. But I I did run it on my own phone when this was released. And you can see that that particular year, I spent a lot of time in the Northeast, spent some time in Texas, Pennsylvania, and California. Um, had a layover in Las Vegas there on a flight once where I checked my mail. And if you zoom in, the data gets all the more interesting. right? I could have told you that I was in all of these places. But if you zoom in, you start to see the granularity. So this is the Boston Bay area. The big blue splotch is right over downtown Boston. A lot of time I spent in Cambridge. I apparently made some trips out to the suburbs for shopping and meals and the like. But most of my time spent in Boston and Cambridge. Um, it's even more amusing to realize that this was a year I was commuting a lot back and forth to Manhattan. Manhattan. And you can see me going up and down on Amtrak. And Dan actually accompanied me on a bunch of these trips. And we have ups, uh, me spending a lot of time in Boston. Here we have New York. Down here we have Stamford. So I spent a lot of time going back and forth there. And you can even see my little vacation on the Cape. Um, <laughs> So it starts to get interesting. And this is the resolution at which it starts to get a little creepy um, and a little disconcerting that someone knows all of this information. Um, more creepy to me was I had no recollection of ever being in Pennsylvania in, um, in that particular year. And then I finally racked my brain, looked through my calendar, and indeed I'd gone to Carnegie Mellon, which is out in Pittsburgh there. Um, and I believe that's the, uh, that's the splotch that got generated. And then on the West Coast, uh, the West Coast we saw earlier, spent some time back there as well. So interesting and really speaks to both the power but also the um perhaps worrisome nature of these things. So this, too, was a question we asked very early on, web apps versus native apps. And back then, we um, had it on a fairly high level. Most folks didn't, hadn't necessarily written native apps before. So I thought it'd be fun to revisit this question. So the next gig you have, either for a personal project or for something at work, which do you go with? Or assume whatever context you would like. Yeah. Web apps. Web apps, why? Okay. So I would really prefer to go with the web apps so that I can have a localized, I mean, common company management serving on a different web apps. Okay, nice. So for services that need to be personalized, things that you want to support across multiple devices, doing web apps is certainly compelling for that reason. Other thoughts? Yeah. It's funny, when I started the class, my bias would have been towards web apps. I don't know if it's because I've had to invest so much time into building native apps, but my bias now, I feel, is more towards native apps because it, it feels like it unlocks more power. Interesting. So unlocks more power having native apps. OK, good. Other thoughts? Yeah. I've been reading a lot about trends that um, you know, Facebook just created a consortium on HTML5, mm -hmm. but Google and, and Apple are reluctant to actually buy into it because I think they're afraid that maybe down the line, you know, web app popularity will suddenly gain steam. But I personally think native apps are you know, important today because you can really leverage the power of the phone. But I wouldn't be surprised if you saw a shift in mobile app development as you know, the WebKit enabled browsers get a little bit more sophisticated. Interesting. OK, so if we're seeing a shift toward web, uh, WebKit-based browsers or HTML5. More generally, sure. Certainly, as more and more features become accessible, among the first of which was geolocation, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Well, just, just to kind of add to that, could you build Instagram, you know, as a as a web app? Interesting question. Could you build something like Instagram as a web app? Oh. Or, or any other app that has a one billion dollar valuation. <laughs> Seriously, because whatever it is, that's what we should be doing. <laughs> YouTube. There. Other, I, was a hand going? Yeah. Yeah. So what, do you, what do you do? I mean, I know you had phone gap um, as part of the beginning, but even still, that does only leverage a certain amount of the phone. So it's kind of a, it's a hard toss-up on which way to go. 
Yeah, no, it is. So the fact that um, Solm Gap, which we'll come back to actually in a bit to come full circle on that too, allows you to implement web apps but wrap them with some native code so that you can still distribute it through the app store and still create the illusion or the upsides of actually having a native app, even though the content is driven website. Um, but you sacrifice some functionality um, because it's not a perfect implementation um, because of the features that sometimes require native code purely. Um, but we'll see actually some of the features that can and can't work in that environment. But agreed, otherwise, as you yourselves have experienced, and some of you might have even tried porting your uh, Android app over to iOS, and there's not much code you can share across the two. Yeah? So I think in the, in the organizations, I, I guess there's a lot of talent which already knows HTML. You know, from that point of view, organizations can leverage you know, that knowledge base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, but again, if you want to develop your own app and market it on the App Store or whatever Android market, then you have to really have to go with the native app. True. No, so that's actually a really good point. I mean, the apps we all know about is not the app that everyone's bookmarking and creating an icon on their screen. It's things that are among the top free apps or the top grossing apps or top paid apps or the like. So there's definitely a marketing implication there as well. I think for a lot of applications, a native app gives a better user experience because you don't have to worry about to send out requests and uh, you know, my carrier uh, always seems to give me a signal to a big bro. Yeah. No, absolutely. And even when we were using jQuery Mobile early on, it's a decent approximation until you then start interacting with it and you realize that you don't quite get the same fluid transitions. The back button doesn't necessarily work in the manner you expect. So, and you don't get all of the UI widgets that you get with UI kit. Or the big part, kit, use of camera. The use so of camera. Like yeah, that. absolutely. Especially Absolutely. So there is a partial solution if you've not yet played but would like to in the future or haven't for your student choice projects. Um, there is this tool that's been quite popular and overall quite successful called PhoneGap. And here's a picture from their website a while back that kind of paints a picture of what you do, really just kind of summarize in marketing terms what happens. But what's compelling here is that it can be your apps can be written largely in HTML and JavaScript but deployed not just to iOS and to Android but to Windows Mobile and to any number of other platforms and at least as a first version of a tool if you really want to make it available broadly and then maybe start throwing away the web app for individual platforms as you have resources or the know-how. Um, it's an interesting option and indeed the chart of support as of today looks like this. So it's a chart that's thankfully gotten larger and larger. Each of the columns represents a platform, each of the rows represents a feature and thanks to something like PhoneGap can you access many more features natively by way of having objective C code for instance in the world of iOS talk to JavaScript code and I'll give you a quick teaser at how this is working. Um, it's not perfect here but it's definitely getting um, better. So how is it working? Well, it literally has to involve talking between browser and between um, objective C code and in the case of iOS you have as you may know this UI web view which is a class that we ourselves didn't use in the class but it's a way of embedding a web browser right inside of an application so you could implement in theory your own version of Safari though I'm sure Apple would reject it from the store but you can embed web content in this way and so if your entire view is essentially a web view you might still have some chrome around the edges of buttons that you might have and tabs you can use a tab controller and the like or navigation controller but most of the content can be coming from the web or at least via JSON objects from some server and it can do this by way of a couple of features of iOS. So UI WebView Delegate is a protocol that a class can implement that's able to communicate with the UI WebView class and it turns out there's a method in there WebView should start loading with request uh, sh should start load with request navigation type that allows you to register your own protocol prefix essentially. So we have HTTP colon slash slash, FTP colon slash slash. So via this mechanism you can tell the web view anytime you get a request for foo colon slash slash, route it to this class and to this method. Let me handle that. So how does this work in more concrete terms with PhoneGap? Well, essentially they've implemented their iOS version of the wrapper as follows. If the user, let's come up with a trivial example, example, 
clicks a link that goes to a URL like this, and that link is embedded in a UI web view, so inside of a native application. Because that URL is prefixed with gap colon slash slash, it's not going to go, obviously, to a web page. But the uh, application is going to realize, oh, this is a registered protocol prefix, even though it's not a protocol per se. And the means by which uh, PhoneGap standardized what URLs mean that start with this prefix is the request is going to trigger the command or method to be pa or message to be passed to that class and using some URL style parameterizations key equals value key equals value arguments can then be passed into that method now once the objective c method has its arguments, it can go and do things. It can open the camera. It can go ahead and write some storage. It can do any number of things natively. But of course, if you want the user to know what just happened, you have to somehow be able to communicate back with them. And recall that the bridge between iOS and the web view now is go or in the between the native app and the web app is going to be this UI web view. So it turns out there's another method that PhoneGap can take advantage of in the UI web view class itself called string by evaluating JavaScript from string. So, so long as the native code in the PhoneGap library returns JavaScript, it can then pass that JavaScript code and with it arguments or effectively return values to the browser window, have the JavaScript execute so that you have now this communication channel between JavaScript code that's embedded in a browser and native code that you yourself have written elsewhere. So in short, you can call Objective-C methods from JavaScript code and those methods can return to or can execute JavaScript methods or functions themselves. So in short, it's actually a very clever trick in the iOS world of having this intercommunication. Yeah? Is there a large performance hit for that? Um, to some extent, certainly, because you're going in and out of the web view. Um, but the JavaScript parser in the, in the iOS SDK is quite good. And generally, it's only information that's being passed back and forth. Uh, Right, exactly. So like Angry Birds, for instance, is not a web app that's simply wrapped in this way because it's far too computationally expensive. But certainly for things that are more data driven, where you're just passing messages of uh, return values and strings back and forth, um, definitely reasonable that a normal human wouldn't notice. Yeah. Good question. Do you need to install any PhoneGap libraries? Short answer, yes. You essentially download from PhoneGap's website a template, so the skeleton of a project that does nothing other than embed a UI web view. And at that point, you take over and start writing the JavaScript code and or HTML and also your own Objective-C classes. But what PhoneGap provides not only for iOS, but for Android and these other platforms are for, uh, the starting points for applications, quite like Android, uh, quite like Eclipse's and Xcode's own templates. It's just these templates have a bit more code that already give you this ability to call functions back and forth. And so if you look on PhoneGap's site at their own documentation, you'll actually see the library of function calls that they provide you with so that you can access native features from JavaScript code. So it's, in, it's frankly a very compelling workaround, especially if the alternative is to go purely web app, which as we've seen is not necessarily the most fluid experience. And this isn't necessarily going to make it better because the UI is still going to be a web view. But at least in this case, you can have it downloadable from the store. The users don't have to do this weird bookmarking thing that no one knows how to do. Um, and you can ship it for multiple platforms relatively easily. Yeah. So it's a good question. I'm, every time I, this question comes up, I kind of poke around. And it seems like the track record with PhoneGap apps has been fairly good. Um, curiously, Adobe bought PhoneGap. Um, it's still made freely available, which I imagine is not going to help long run. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, so long as the app is doing things that don't run afoul of Apple's other guidelines, some of which I'll mention in a bit, um, people seem to be having good success. Yeah. All right. So in short, a nice teaser for your next step where you can sort of take everything you've learned in the class, meld it together, and now start calling yourself a Palm developer, Blackberry developer, and the like without having uh, had to dive deeply into any of them. So those uh, bunch of you have dived in now to provisioning. Um, Long story short, this is the pain in the neck in iOS, um, both for you and for us. Because every time you want to do something, we have to jump through hoops to approve it and go through to the website. This is not a fun environment. But to Apple's credit, uh, there's no known malware in the App Store. So this bar is at least has been raised sufficiently. But just to paint a picture of what you've been doing, perhaps just by kind of blindly clicking through things, or what you will do if you'd like still uh, this semester or after term's end to have your own developer account, this is out from the Apple's documentation that tries to paint a 
graphical picture of what's going on. And in a nutshell, if you've done this or haven't done this, you need to uh, create a public-private key pair using keychain access or similar tools on your Mac. You then keep the private key locally on your computer. If you have multiple computers, you can export that key and then import it into other computers. Realize that's possible. Realize that's uh, has implications for working in the labs on campus if you're leaving your private keys all over the place or just losing them when the machines get wiped. So just realize that you're leaving remnants there. But you upload the public key uh, to the so-called provisioning portal after logging in with your own Apple ID. Uh, presumably we have added you to our academic team, the university account. And this just means we then get an email saying, hey, so-and-so has submitted a certificate. We then have to go in and approve this. If we have no idea who you are, we can reject it. But otherwise, it's a pretty mindless approval process. At that point, you need to also tell us or have told us your device ID. So every iOS device has a very long uh, uniquely identifying string because these uh, provisioning profiles that you're ultimately going to download only work on your device. So you can't really do a runaround on the App Store because if you wanted to distribute your app to, say, all of your friends, well, you're going to have to have all of your friends figure out their unique device IDs. And even then, even if you have a paid developer account, they limit the number of devices you can add to your development account. So it's pretty much capped at 100 or 200 of your friends, which is maybe plenty, but I mean, imagine how long it took you to figure out your device ID. Imagine doing that with all of your friends. It's just not going to happen. So another bar that's been raised. So ultimately, you submit that certificate. We approve it. And what we then have to package up, literally just by clicking a bunch of things on the website, which you too would do if you had your own uh, paid account, uh, we create a bundle that includes inside of it your device ID, something called an app ID, and your development certificate, which is like a digitally signed copy of your certificate saying we approve this thing. And the app ID, you might see throughout Xcode, this is the thing you've probably seen that's edu.harvard.extension.star. It could have been foo. We could have chosen any string. We just standardized on that. The star is important. Actually, um, one of your classmates helped me remember that um, you have to have the star unless you want to tell us in advance what all of your apps are called. So we can give you provisioning profiles only for Hangman if we only wanted to let you compile Hangman on your phone or run Hangman on your phones. But realize that has to do with the name of your own application, the company identifier. So in short, it's a pain in the neck. Um, so. Uh, but uh, if you do sign up for the $99 or the $299 or $199 program, just realize that there are steps involved in distributing apps. And there's some third-party startups that have actually started to make this process easier, making it possible even to do over-the-air provisioning, which is much more compelling than having to connect the USB cable to your computer, which you've probably been doing now. All right. Any questions about the, the notion of provisioning or any issues you yourself have run into? All right. It's, yeah. I don't know if this is new with the new version of Xcode, but I literally plugged it in, pressed like two clicks, and it provisioned and did everything for me. So the, all the instructions, especially the people who gave us, it, I, had to, I skipped through um, 20 pages for it. So that's good. Xcode has gotten better at this, whereby once we've added your Apple ID to our accounts, you can do this automatic team provisioning. Um, Oh, OK, even better, since you had, because Xcode will prompt you at some point for your Apple ID. So yes, they've thankfully made this easier and automated some of these here steps. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, no, I was saying that's good. Yes, yeah, no, it is, it is quite good. And then as for the App Store itself, so ultimately, um, and there's no apps currently in this account, but in Apple Style, there's a web page that you can go to once you actually have an application. Maybe it's your Hangman implementation, your student choice project, if you'd like to make it available for free or for 99 cents. Essentially, it'll involve using, again, your Apple ID to log into their website, uploading uh, and inputting some information for them, waiting some number of hours or days for an approval process, and voila your app then appears in the App Store. And as you may recall from a few weeks back, one of our students working for one of Harvard's hospitals had their own little stir fry application for doing nutritional content and the like. So please, um, over the next few months or a year or two, if you do do this, feel free to reach out to me or Dan or Tommy and let us know if you have uh, some success stories that you'd like us to share with future students. Um, so this is a really funny document. You can only get at this if you have a paid account, um, but I think it, remarkably inconsistent with Apple's usual style, I think there's literally a sentence in their developer guidelines, which are many, many pages of things you should or should not put into the App Store. And my favorite one was, 
quote unquote, the world does not need any, does not need any more fart applications. Um, so that's one of the guidelines. So if you were thinking of going there, it's probably not going to get rejected. That's for the Android store instead. Um, <laughs> But realize that there are official guidelines. So if you do go this route, it's worth doing some due diligence there just to make sure you don't invest months of your life um, building something that uh, there's explicitly some content around, uh, some restrictions around. So that's available there. Um, and then lastly, before I turn things over to Dan, um, the app party. So this is a tradition we started uh, in the course where by the end of the semester and May 4th, Friday, um, to optimize people's availability from 5.30 to roughly 7.30, we'll serve some food and some cake and hopefully you and some of your distant classmates will join us in Maxwell Dorkin to just show off applications and shake hands and uh, see what each other's been up to, especially in the context of the student choice applications. So it's always fun to see what others have been up to. Um, feel free to invite family or friends. Um, colleagues if they'd like to just check out what's going on, um, but we'll email the details around again uh, in the days that follow. Um, so before I turn things over to Dan, um, let me just mention, so this course, I'm really just the guy who joined this course uh, last year and latched on. This course was really the brainchild of Dan and another fellow, Giuseppe, who started this course under a different number a couple of years ago, but it's really all thanks to Dan um, that I owe um, this opportunity and this course's existence. Um, and it's quite sad, Dan's actually leaving Cambridge and heading off to uh, graduate school in, at Berkeley. Um, so this will be the last time my knowledge, um, unless we do something truly distant where the teacher is finally distant, um, this will probably be the last time he's involved with this course. Um, so if we could just acknowledge the years that he's put into this course um, with a round of applause, I'll introduce Dan Armandar. <laughs> Hello again, everybody. It's been a while since I've seen you, and so hopefully um, to shock your systems a little bit more, more than just being able to see me once again, uh, remember this stuff? From a while ago, Eclipse and that whole mess, you're probably all used to the, uh, the beauty, relatively, of, of Xcode, perhaps, in some ways. But we are actually going to talk a little bit about some of this stuff in Eclipse when uh, we talk a little bit more specifically about PhoneGap in just a moment. But before then, I do want to show you something which was released last year, but is still actually a pretty cool visualization of some of the activations of Android devices. And so this is basically just that, exactly. It is just a video of activations of Android devices um, historically, from the very first Android device, the, uh, the uh, Google, what was that, the G1. And anyway, so you can see here what it sort of looks like, but when you, when you, if you, as you watch it, one of the things that you'll notice is that there tend to be these sharp explosions of activations over time that correlate pretty well with various uh, release dates of devices. And in fact, as we keep watching, they, they also highlight some other uh, some specific geographic regions as well, which actually help make it a little bit more apparent uh, what, what Android devices are being released in which areas and what that is actually doing in terms of, um, in terms of, that, uh, in terms of how popular that particular device happens to be in a particular region. And so it's kind of interesting to watch, especially the worldwide view, because you can see how some of these devices were released first, perhaps, in the United States. And so you would see an explosion of activations there. And then they would be introduced overseas. And you would see a sort of uh, correlated uh, release of, of all of these extra devices there as well. And so this now is just uh, specific to the continental US. And you can sort of see how there's it's relatively light activations at first for the, the first few uh, the first few months of the release of an Android device, but then pretty soon we actually get to see that one, uh, one of the more popular Android devices gets released, in this case the Motorola Droid, and all of a sudden as a result of that do we start to see now a, a lot of these sorts of activations. Now really the, the reason that I'm showing this to you is, is not to, uh, to point out that um, Android devices are you know, all over the place, even though that is kind of the case. It's that there's a lot of data that's available out there now about the distribution of smartphone devices, uh, the breakdown between iOS devices and Android devices, and some of the other ones as well. And it's sort of important to realize that it's, you have to take that, that information with a grain of salt. And also to take into account the history, what actually leads us to that data that is actually uh, being released. And so it's very easy to say right now that one platform is, is winning over the other. Um, in this particular moment, I think Android is actually winning over iOS. But if we don't take a look at the grander scheme, then it, you might 
realize that when you start to work on an Android application or when you start to work on an iOS application and you pick one of those platforms based on the popularity of that platform at that moment, you might be missing out on something altogether more interesting or something that's altogether more revealing about the history and about the long-term effects of that release of that product. In particular, here's some data that's actually kind of interesting. And this is US smartphone penetration. This is uh, data that's been released by Nielsen, which typically does, you might recall the Nielsen name uh, because they do a lot of uh, data for advertisements on in television and now they do a lot of uh, online advertisement data tracking as well. But they also do this for um, for smartphones as well because now there's a lot of advertisements that are being made available on free applications as well and so now very recently I believe this was this was data that was released March 29th of this year so just uh, just a few weeks ago in fact does Nielsen actually say that during February 2012 50 percent of the United States mobile phone subscribers had a smartphone and to me, this sounded a little bit low, but I guess that's actually pretty respectable given the, you know, how vast the, the United States actually is and how many people there are within it. But still, this is obviously a growing trend that more and more people are going to have smartphones. So that's all well and good. But if we start to now take a look at the, pla at the breakdown in platforms between Android and iOS, which we know are, are sort of the, the leading platforms right now, we can actually see that right now at this moment, Android tends to lead iOS. Uh, rather than um, rather than the other way around, but like I said before, this can actually be kind of misleading because this data is very temporal it can, and it can change in a, in a in a big way. Uh, on the left, for example, is a graph that says of all of the smartphone owners, what is the current breakdown? of the operating system. So if you take a look just at that naive and relatively simple view of what the breakdown of, of OS market share is, we can see that Android is winning by, by some number of percentage points, by 16% over, uh, um, of the total number of users over iOS. And, but if we actually start taking a look at some of the more recent data, some of the recent data that's, that's, being, uh, that's showing perhaps purchases of smartphones over the past few, few months, can we actually see that in fact iOS leads Android? And what I think you'll actually find if you start taking a look at some of this, this history, <coughs> excuse me, if you start taking a look at some of the, <coughs> the history of this data is that this really does sort of change left and right and it correlates relatively well I think with the release of devices that are very um, highly anticipated and also very heavily marketed. So Apple doesn't release new devices all that often. They do in this case their, their current track record is one per year, one iPhone per year. <coughs> And so if we, were to t if we were to take a look at that, we would see that, in fact, iOS activations tend to slow down right before the time that the new device is released. And as soon as it's released, there's, of course, this explosion of new devices that are, are these new iPhone devices, new iOS devices that are, in fact, activated in, in, um, in smartphone activations. And similarly, in Android, and I think what Android happens to enjoy right now is the fact that there are a lot more hardware manufacturers that tend to market very heavily. And so, for example, some of the, uh, the commercials that you might have seen lately is for the, frankly, rather ridiculous Samsung Note. Uh, which is a rather large smartphone. It kind of seems whether well, it can't decide between the being a smartphone or a tablet, and it has a uh, um, my goodness, what are, what are those pen like? Yeah, a stylus now. Like, why are we bringing this back? All this these silly things. But anyway, once that is being released, we will actually see. I think that there is, or if it's not already released. Uh, we'll, we'll see that there's quite a few Android activations as a result. And so all I'm saying here is that while you, you're going to take the knowledge from this course home and you might decide when you want to create an application, you want to try to target your application for uh, perhaps for your largest audience and taking other things into account as well, such as the, e the ease of, through which you can actually uh, code for a particular platform and other considerations as well. Don't just look at these raw values because um, and, and because it is sort of simplistic to look at this and say, well, all right, Android leads right now, so that means that Android's the most popular, it's going to remain the most popular, so I'm going to code for that. That may or may not, true, that may or may not remain true over time. Just uh, be mindful of that as you decide to pursue developing for mobile applications. Now, last year, I was trying to find some more recent data um, than this, but last year, Nielsen released, released this graph which is the next desired operating system, which I think was kind of an interesting addition of data in combination with some of the graphs that we just saw. And in this case, um, 
What we're looking at is the comparison. There's two colors here. There's blue and yellow. Blue is on the left. The one on the left, the blue color, it represents data from July 2010 through September 2010. And yellow represents data from January 2011 through March 2011. So this is now data that's about a year old. But you can see sort of interesting trends in this graph. Um, <coughs> Nielsen asked via survey what some people would want their next smartphone OS to be. And they did this in two different time periods, the one from 2010 and the one from 2011. And we can compare that data. So on the very far left, for example, we can actually see Android and how that has actually gone up in time from 2010 to 2011, how more people in 2011 wanted their next smartphone to be Android smartphones. And uh, the one directly next to that was iOS and how there was a, a little bit of a drop. And I really wanted to see newer data, and I don't have it unfortunately, to see if this has been, if this remains the same, if this has been swapped, because we actually get to see this sort of competitiveness between Google and, and Apple as they release new products and or, well, Google doesn't necessarily release new products but as new products are released with Google's Android and so on and so forth we might actually see uh, some different data being told um, here as well. Now this is actually pretty important because uh, you might decide altogether that what you want to create is an application that works not just on one of these platforms, a native application as we've seen throughout this class, but also one that does work cross-platform as well using this software that David mentioned a little while ago called PhoneGap. And PhoneGap is really kind of neat and it's, very, uh, it's a very easy way to get multi-platform application up and running very quickly. In fact, this is just the standard Eclipse project, and you can see, uh, if you remember some of this stuff, some of this stuff from six weeks ago, I know it's a little hard to remember, but if you go back in time and remember that we had in Eclipse these projects that had the very specific hierarchy that, that created an Android, uh, that created an Android package file, we can actually see some of that hierarchy here, the source directory, for example, uh, our resource directory, and this new one called assets. And within assets, we're actually including a dub 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 folder, which itself Itself includes an HTML file, an index.html file. So if you know HTML, if you know CSS, if you know JavaScript, you can actually code native applications for a wide variety of platforms. Now what David mentioned before was, was exactly this, but this is a more specific example. This is in fact an actual implementation of a phone gap application that you can take, you could pull this code from index.html plop it into an iOS project that also is using the PhoneGap framework, and you should be able to find that perhaps only with minor modifications, if any at all, that this application would continue to work across both of those applications, or rather both of those platforms. Now this does of course require that you actually create two separate applications. You're not going to be able to compile one application and use that, install it on either iPhone or Android devices. You do actually have to create separate executable files as, as normal, you actually would go through Eclipse, for example, to create an Android APK file, to create a phone gap executable through there, but then you could actually take the code that you've already written within this assets folder and plop it into the, the similarly created Xcode project and be able to compile that and provision it for, um, for distribution to the, uh, to the App Store or to your own personal device. And so here we can see a couple of things that enable this to happen. First of all, there's a libs directory right here that includes a phone gap jar file. Now this is actually important and this, this might actually be a slightly older version. You can download the newest version from the phone gap website. Uh, phone gap actually goes through very easy steps on how you actually would create this, but it's really relatively easy. They include the um, the very first activity that's also going to be responsible for displaying that and very much like the equivalent of having the web view in, uh, in iOS would we actually have a web view here in Android as well to display that web page that we had just created. But the phone gap library actually enables a lot of the hardware features of the phone, of the device to be accessible to the JavaScript, uh, to the to JavaScript within this framework or within this application that we've created. And in fact, it makes it very easy to access it. So here what we have is just this file that is an HTML file with JavaScript. And if we were to take a look at this code itself, can we see a couple of things? First of all, we can actually monitor the, acceler the accelerometer in this hardware device. And this is some, not something that you can do with the standalone uh, Safari built-in browser, the built-in browser that uses WebKit, which is, is used across a variety of, of these platforms. But you can't access the hardware accelerometer 
using just the standard HTML5 page. You would, in fact, have to build a native application in normal circumstances. Well, in this case, because we're using the PhoneGap API, we actually can reference within our bundled HTML web page the accelerometer and some of the other hardware features as well. <coughs> so I heard mentioned before about this idea of uh, being able to implement Instagram, for example. I do think that you do get access to uh, um, being able to take a picture as well. So you might be able to use, uh, take a photo with that, and then that, that raw photo could be passed to your, um, uh, to your uh, JavaScript, and you would be able to do something with that as well. So this basically is just a relatively simple application. If I were to run it, it compiles it. As we see before, uh, notice there's a little warning that's down here, but that's okay. We are not too concerned about it. Now it looks like this application. Whoops. Uh, hold on. Oh, and it happened to crash just now. That's just great. One second. Let's see if it'll load up. All right, so this is it. And so this isn't a terribly exciting demo because this isn't, and it crashes again, uh, because it doesn't actually have, uh, this is of course the emulator, and I can't actually emulate the hardware accelerometer. But if you were to install this on a hardware device and hope it doesn't crash, you could actually rotate the phone and that text would actually follow the rotation so that it was always level relative to the horizontal, which is kind of a, a neat, if uh, rather contrived demo, but still is a way that we can demonstrate how you can use PhoneGap to access some the specific hardware features of the device using this HTML5, uh, using relatively simple HTML5 techniques. And so this is actually something that's really easy and a pretty simple thing for you to for you to implement on your own. And I certainly recommend that you, if you're interested in cross-platform development, that you actually take a look at um, oh, what's going on. That you actually take a look at PhoneGap. Um, to try to do that sort of thing and uh, because it will make it a little bit easier for you um, to implement your own cross-platform application across a variety of devices, even for ones that we hadn't, didn't get a chance to discuss in this, uh, in this class, like Windows Mobile devices, Symbian, uh, RIM, BlackBerry devices, so on and so forth. Now, once you've actually created your application, there's a couple of ways that you can actually deploy it. And we didn't get a chance to talk about this before, but in reference specifically to Android, you have, you're not limited to just a single app store like what Apple has. You actually have the, the ability to choose how and where your application gets distributed. Now normally you could just go through Google's equivalent of the App Store, which um, was used, used to be called the Android Market. Now this is actually outdated and this, the Android Market no longer exists. It does exist in some form, but it's been replaced by Google Play, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But also there's another App Store that exists by Amazon. So the Amazon App Store is also another way that you could distribute your application if it has terms that are a little bit more agreeable to you or for whatever reason you decide that it might be a more powerful way to release your own application. And in fact, there's nothing stopping you uh, from releasing your application to both of these stores at the same time, or even to none of them. You could also deploy to your own website and have people just download it directly from your website if you wanted to do it that way as well. That might be a little bit riskier because then it's a little bit easier to, to copy your, your application, but if, you're not really, if you don't really care about that so much, then that certainly is something that you could do as well. Now, uh, like I mentioned before, the, Google, the Android Marketplace has been replaced by Google Play, which really, it, it, it's really subsumed the Marketplace. So everything that you knew, if you knew anything about the Marketplace before, your knowledge is still relevant, still is, still, still is useful in terms of Google Play. It's just a, a rebranding, basically. And Google Play now includes more than just an app store and a marketplace for your Android applications, but it also includes a variety of other things like books and music and movies and a whole bunch of other stuff. They're just trying to consolidate all of this stuff into a single store, which I kind of understand that they, they, they want to do to compete more against iTunes, I suppose. Uh, an Apple's own offering in this case. Now these though is a comparison or this is a comparison of some of the terms between Google Play and the Amazon App Store when you actually want to release your Android application to one or the other. And uh, so Google Play for example has a one-time fee of $25 
And that's it. Once you do that, then you're, you're a developer and you can release your applications to Google Play and have them downloaded by any, uh, by any person that has an Android device. The transaction fee, if you happen to sell your, um, your, your application for money, then very much like how Apple takes a slice off the top when you sell some through the App Store, then Google does the same. Uh, it's actually 30%, so you get 70% of the, of the resultant cost uh, back to you. And uh, Google Play actually supports a variety of countries, and there's actually no approval process. There's actually no formal approval process, but Google still has guidelines, and they still ha can and have revoked applications in the past for being malicious or for violating content guidelines or for doing a variety of things that are, in fact, bad. Um, one of the applications that comes to mind is GrooveShark. If you're not familiar, GrooveShark is an application, is a web app specifically, that allows you to play music online. And it's kind of a, an interesting concept, but uh, Google seems to have catered a little bit to the recording industry and has pulled that uh, from their, the marketplace, even though there it's, I mean, granted it's perhaps on, on legally shady, legally great ground, but it's not been determined one way or another, but still they made, they made some concessions uh, to that industry. So I do say that there's no approval process, but that's why there's that little asterisk, asterisk there. They still can uh, and might pull your application if it's, particularly, um, if it's particularly bad. Now, the Amazon App Store, however, is very different. It's much more, you could consider it to be a little bit more like the um, like um, Apple's App Store, just in that it does have an approval process. And they do have guidelines online. If you're to go to Amazon App Store's frequently asked questions, it has a, a really good documentation about what constitutes an application that can be um, rejected from their App Store and what, what sort of guidelines you have to meet in order to ensure that your application is approved but it still does have this process that you would have to go through. So arguably there's the same arguments regarding the App Store, the, uh, the Apple App Store, and the pros and cons about having this, this uh, approval process might apply here as well. But Amazon, what's, what makes this interesting, I think, is that there's, this is an opportunity for your application to be auto-marketed to users already on the internet. So Amazon really has nailed down this idea of marketing other applications, or rather, marketing other um, products to people that have similar interests. Well, I mean, Amazon has been selling things for, for a while now online, so they know how to do this, and presumably this is why people might choose to list some things on the Amazon App Store as well, to increase the visibility of their apps and try to get some additional marketing for free, basically, in that manner. The downside is that it is US only, and it does have a, a yearly program fee of $99, but they do waive it for the first year if that's something that you're interested in. Now, there's some other stuff that's interesting that's not listed on this slide, and that's that Google actually has a maximum application size of 50 megabytes. So if you're going to upload your application to Google Play, it can only be 50 megs. Now, you might say, well, that's sort of bad, because I know some apps that might actually need to be several gigabytes in size. For example, perhaps in, uh, in application that uh, uh, loads maps on your phone, like a GPS app, for example, well, they do actually have some additional uh, SDKs or they, uh, where you can actually create additional APK files, and those can be downloaded on the fly by your application. So you can try to make your initial download relatively lightweight and then just download whatever additional files you need um, from their servers that way. Uh, there's no particular limit for Amazon, but if it goes over 30 megabytes, you have to go through this a uh, little bit stranger upload process. Uh, you have to go through their FTP servers, I think, rather than their slick web app that allows you to upload and put your application for sale directly there. But there is something that's interesting about Amazon is, is that they add a wrapper application around your APK file. So what you have to do is they will actually give you a certificate that's unique to you, and you, you compile your APK file with that certificate. You give them your APK, and then they wrap it around another application that is going to use that information or that's going to um, rather collect usage information whenever somebody actually uses that application, sends it up to Amazon, and will do other things like that. And so that's sort of an interesting thing that, that they're doing. Whether or not that's a, a positive or negative, I think sort of remains to be seen. You have to weigh that for yourself as you actually decide which of these two, if not both, that you want to upload your own application to. But that is something to, um, to keep in mind here as well. So with this then, you have 
a variety of choices to be able to apply your knowledge from, uh, from this class. You can actually create some native applications, not only for uh, iOS and for Android, but also for additional platforms as well. If you wanted to go home and do some additional research on PhoneGap and use these, these techniques that you've learned, not only for native apps, but also for web apps, and apply them to a variety of platforms there. But um, even within each of these, um, within the context of Android, you really have the, the capability to pick how your own application can be distributed and where it can actually go uh, from there. And so with that, we're really interested to see what it is that you guys come up with as a result of this class. Uh, we, we sort of get emails from, uh, from former students all the time saying, oh, hey, look, my application is up on the App Store. And it's really neat to see not only that, that they've been published, but also the quality of, of all of the applications that I've seen that have come from former students has always been really, really high. And, and it's sort of been amazing that um, uh, coming out of this class, you know, it's going to be that good. So anyway, take, rest assured that uh, with, um, with all of the knowledge that you have, you, you actually can release an application that can do, in fact, uh, uh, pretty well, I think, in not only on the App Store, but in the marketplace. But uh, with that, we want to thank you all very much for coming to, to this class overall. And uh, we hope to see you in one of the future classes offered by, uh, by one of us. So again, thank you all. We'll see you then.